this chapter 15, and I just want to make a comment that I noticed this reference even in verse 1 to the rock of God. I'm never very happy with the rock of God, but the idea of the rock of God, or God being angry or anything like that, although that's, that can be argued to be scriptural. However, uh, I didn't have that around, but I decided to do a bit of investigation about this word from the Greek, which is translated here as rock. And it's, it's a very uh, uncertain justification to, trans, uh, to translate it as rock. The, the Greek word actually means to, to rush, and it carries the idea, uh, as my lexicon put it, of strong passion or emotion of the mind. Now you can derive from that the idea of anger or wrath, but equally, this is where I am, I very much lean to the idea of here we have in this first verse of this 15th chapter the idea of the, the passion, the strong feeling that God has for us, of course, and for our happiness. So just bear that in mind, I'll, I'll actually read it to the book of God. But please, it's not, uh, it's not going to set in concrete if that's the way it has to be translated. He said, I might have the idea of the strength of God's passion, his love and care of that for us. Thank you for that, Ian. That can help me a lot. It that can help me a lot. You want, I can give you my little note from afterwards <laughs> when I got it from the. Uh, no, I hope that. The Mexican so let's, let us turn our minds to this <coughs> short, eight verse chapter from the book of Revelation, chapter 15, the word of the Lord. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels, having the seven mark plagues, for in them the wrath, strong feeling, passion of God is complete. And I saw as though a seated glass mingled with fire, and those who had the victory over the beast, over its image, and over its mark, and over the number of its name, standing beside the seated glass, having hearts of gold. God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the Saints. You do not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name, but you alone are for you. Therefore all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been made manifest. <coughs> After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle as a testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in clean, bright linen, having their chests girded with golden sashes. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls, full of the rock of God, who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were ended. In verses 3 and 4, there is just an example of some of the most amazing and inspiring and uplifting scripture in the whole of the Bible. Great and marvelous over the work of God Almighty, just to try your ways that he descends. Because I fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name, you alone are the Lord. So, such wonderful praise. <laughs> so take the theme friends from the Bible. Ian, that was amazing. And we can translate that full of the passion of God. I have no idea what you've done for me today in terms of 
even the message that I'm preparing to bring, uh, the, this is all the email I mentioned that about the secret cut there. It's tied in so well to the what you're saying there about the passion of God. And even the faith, the cuts on the faith that I'm dealing with, and not what we think they are. But that's why we do that. Dear Lord, we lift this up to you as an offering, a token. A small thank you, Lord, for the gift of this day that you give us. Lord, it really is a gift. Let each breath be in faith to you. The little people, if I can have you come up. And I'll get you to be hand too. Right where you are, how about me and Alex and we'll just say the word. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As in heaven, so on the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, and we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and now and the glory forever. Would you help me out for a second? Come stand over here. You two girls, can you? Just walk down on the ground, curl up like a little ball. Just down like that. And when Matthew comes to touch you on the head, I want you to jump up and throw your arms up in the air with life. So if Matthew's going to be the Lord here for us, Healing, touch with someone, and up they come with new life. Go on, there's, a, <laughs> there's another one, there's another one there. And you touch them up with new life. Being healed. Okay, so we're going to use it again in a moment. Just sit for a second. Wait there, that's good. And I'm reading here for you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. And they went out from thence and came into his own country, the Lord's own country. And his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, For whence has this man these things, and what wisdom is he given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by him? Is this not the carpenter? the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters living here with us? And they were offended. Offended. They were offended with Jesus. Jesus said, A prophet is not without honour in his own country and among his own kin. And there he could not do many mighty works, save he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and he healed them. Okay, so come over again. Now this one, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a huge spirit, and it's touch on the head when that's like that's a new run. Run over the next thing and I'll find you. Okay, when you come, Jesus, I want you to come in to heal them, but you're not gonna get to them. I'm gonna get in the way and say, Go, go, run away. Run away! Right, Jesus, he takes it over there. Now, I have often heard this passage quoted to me by people saying, even Jesus had a hard time. What do you mean? Well, he couldn't heal some people. Really? What people could he heal? All the people in his own hometown. He couldn't heal them. Now, if you think about this carefully, there's something wrong in this life. Now, what happened that second time when Matthew being Jesus wanted to come in? 
They wanted to heal the people. What happened? They ran away. What happened? The evil spirit came and touched them, and then what did they do? They ran away. Is that right? Now, what was your question? What if they didn't run away? Well, what do you think would happen? What do you think would have happened if they hadn't run away? They would have been healed. They would have been healed. Thank you. Bill out of mouth of <laughs> they, they would have been healed, wouldn't they? So, what's going on in this passage is not that Jesus was without power to help them, it's that they were so ended with him. That's a big word. What does it ended mean? Annoy that. That's pretty good. It's getting there. And maybe they were mean, and then they turn into that's not nice. Yes. But then, what did they do? Run away. That's good. We put what Matthew said together, we put that together. Definitely getting annoyed in there, isn't it? You're getting offended, you get annoyed, don't you? And then, you run away or you stay away from that. And that's what happened here. Now, if we were to go on reading a little bit further, I want it does say that Jesus then went on and marveled at their unbelief and began to teach. So that's, that's the best thing you can do. It's the best thing you can do is maybe when you get some of the wrong idea is to try and get some the information that are given right up. So what was the idea they had about Jesus? It's a right idea. Jesus is in heaven, that's the right idea. So what what were they saying about Jesus that got them offended? They thought the Lord wasn't trying to help them come to Remember what they said though? They said, hang on a sec. This man once grew up here with our He was just a kid once he got the rest of that. How can he be special? <laughs> That was part of their attention. They got attention because they were looking at him with the wrong kind of eyes. They were looking at him not as someone that, that God had sent to him, but they were looking at him as just another little child of money. Look at him with different eyes. Now, I haven't written it down here, but in the very next verse we find something fascinating. And it's amazing to put these little pieces together. In the next verse. Wait, it, wait, wait. Some, they have to be right, right, new eyes. A different perspective, a different point of view. You'll be good at English. Okay, so what it says in the next verse is that Jesus then calls his disciples to him and says, I'm going to send you out. And I'm going to give you power and you're going to heal people and you're going to tell them the gospel. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen that before. I mean, we all know the story of Jesus sending his disciples out, right? But did we realise it was because they were offended with him? So he said someone else. He gave them his power. Isn't that amazing? Now the most important thing for us to take away from today is two things. God loves us so much that sometimes we get offended at it. We find another way. Secondly, let's try not to get offended. In the first place, it's all about the kind of eyes we have and how we look at God. If bad things are happening in our life, do we blame God? Yes, I think. Type of perspective we have not. I'm going to make a good picture out of you. <laughs> let me try this again. Let, let us change our perspective on God when we when bad things are happening and we want to blame God. <laughs> what comes from God? Good. Bad. Mm-hmm. A bad thing is coming from God? Mm-hmm. Bad things come from bad people. Bad things come from bad people. Mm-hmm. 
Oh. A woman tells me to sit down in the front. By Green Road. They sat down in ranks by hundreds of people. And when they had taken the five loaves from the people, he looked up to heaven and was blessed and he broke the loaves. And he gave to his disciples and said before them, I found a little bit like holy stuff in me. And there were two fishes to my book, five and three among the wall. They did all this and were filled. And he took up twelve baskets of breaking and of fish. So we have here a type of prophecy, a promise of the Lord being our shepherd, restoring the head, preparing the place for us to go. And feeding, well done, a sense of eternity, promise. The Lord is saying, I will give you that. You don't have money to buy, and you will say, I will give you It's going to happen when you die. I'm really giving a lot of thought. The Lord is saying, I will give you And every time we celebrate holy time, we enact the breaking of the bread. There is a reminder here, a prophecy again, the Lord has prepared a place for us. That he has prepared a place for us, that he now encompasses the water, and that he may sure that everyone is born. written take the Lord is good. After the Lord had blessed the tongue, he gave it to his disciples. He said, Bring the order. This is my blood in the covenant. Shed for the sin.
It is written, you are the light of the world, so let your life. So again, welcome, to those who are online, welcome. What's your thought to go back for a moment to a time where we set the challenge of five and a half? Or any clock, one walk, particularly I like the idea of one. What's the heart? Is it first step? Think about it. For most of us, it's a lot. But there are some people who never even take They're afraid. They're afraid of failing. Or maybe they're afraid of the hard work. Or maybe they just don't see the value. They just couldn't care. They're just like, whatever reason they don't take that But here, I'm among those who have taken it. I'm among those who are venturing with the Lord. And we arrived right here today at chapter 15. One more crest. One more thing. One more cliff come over. Now think about it. You find a really hard mountain. And you just come over that cliff. And your body's exhausted. And you see your goal. Right there in front of you. What happens? That's what you need Your body's tired. You're exhausted. Is a rush of new life, new energy. Something happens on the inside of the transformation. And you move through the pain, way to get it towards your goal. Today, chapter 15 is going to touch on this very subject. Five things I want to highlight for you today from the chapter. <clears throat> We're dealing with heavenly work. Two, we dealing with archetypes. And the importance, I hope today you will come away with a real greater appreciation for the archetypes for what often will happen. Hope. Chapter about that hope. And there's also chaos. Back 
you, you don't really wear a round belly for that. You get somewhere and you go, no, not really a round belly. Today we're going to look at those seven plagues, the seven vaults, not at the actual plague, but the concept, this idea that apocalyptic language throws at us. Here comes the seven vaults of God, full of the wrath of God. Chapter 15, verse 1, I saw another sign in heaven. And this is exactly the way chapter 14 started as well. That would be the same idea. Another sign in heaven. And there's a few other places in the apocalypse where this exact kind of language comes out. I saw another sign in heaven. Now, it's all vision, all apocalyptic, all speaking about something happening inside us. But particularly here, it's saying in heaven. And the key, the key problem and the key importance of this passage, so often that we approach this scripture, we're like those five lows. Not enough. Five senses. We're looking. And we're looking at what the world's doing. We're looking at what government's doing. We're looking at what the person down the street's doing. We're looking at what our husband and wife's doing. And often we stop in and say, well, what's going on? These things are happening inside us. And the best example I can think of of what that looks like is the Lord Himself. Garden of Seven. Right after the Holy Supper, He moves to the Garden of Seven. He tells His disciples, wait. He moves in deeper into the Garden. Brings free with him, Peter, James, and God. Our problems began in God. Jesus tells Peter, James, and John, pray with him, and he moves just a little bit further over. Then what happens? Just to the disciples. They fall asleep, don't they? And what about the Lord? What's the Lord going through? Agony. Sheer agony. So much agony, the scripture says he's placed blood. But except for that, except for that one sign of splitting blood, we've got no real evidence of how much agony is going. We've all been in a situation where we're in agony. And we don't want other people to know, isn't it? We've been in that position. And for a short period of time, you can put up a good front. You can smile, you can out everything. Yeah, you can lie. Yeah, it's great. Set there. And as soon as they're gone, you have your right there. Internal things aren't visible always on the external. And if they are, it's often not an indication of it. I have thought long and hard about how how to steer us in the right direction of these afterlife. And as I was working on this chapter, it dawned on me the answer that I was looking for. I wrote it down. The more internal a process you're going through. The more internal a process that you are engaging in, the more apocalyptic the archetypes need to be. Does that make sense? How do you describe agony? It hurts. Well, that's a bit shallow, but it does it hurt. When you're going through internal processes, the Lord uses all of these kind of archetypes in the scripture to describe the unfold of the Trumpets of love. Oh, well, I'm right now. You're going to die. I'm going to die. And we go on like it's nothing. We walk around like we're half asleep, don't we? I mean, we do. <laughs> we dawn on it, and then we sort of wander back to sleep and carry on with There you go, I just blew a trumpet. But at some point during the day, we'll come back to that at some point, and it'll go a little deeper. And we'll have a cut. Right. 
you actually realize what that means. I better get my affairs in. I better get my affairs in. I better prepare. You jump on a plane and fly to another country. You have to think. So we move from, well, the Baron said something like, oh, we're going to die, it's a trumpet, to a cut moment, where I really start to die in the chest to take in the reality of what's going on. The Lord says here in Matthew 26, Oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He continues to pray and struggle. A little while later, he says it again, slightly different. He says, Oh my Father, if this cup may not pass me, except I drink, then you will be done. Cup moments. We all have them, we're all going to have them. Death is a cup moment. But Jesus did say, Blessed are they. If you jump to the front of the order first, right down the bottom there. He that does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He that finds his life shall lose it, but he that loses his life, I say, shall find it. A cup moment right there. How easy it is for us to run from our cup moments. Well, we have seven of them to come. Well, hang on, it says seven goals. Actually, in the Greek, it's piale, or pialas, or plural, it's bold, but piale, which we get our word, piale, or vile. Bold or vile. In fact, if you go into the Greek, wrong way, if you go into the Greek, doesn't know where the root word B-I-L-A comes from. But it does suggest a broad, shallow cup. And when I realised this, the light bulb went on. And I'm determined to make sure the light bulb went on. It doesn't ring quite as powerful. Though. Seven angels with seven cups. But that's what it's actually saying. Seven angels with seven cups. In our house, we really like this. I kind of like coffee, but I really like tea. Not as much as the rest of the men have done. So much so that we had a bit of a kind of cultural thing of getting different sorts of tea cups. Well, with grace, water. We started introducing larger and larger cups. <laughs> Get more tea that way, isn't it? Get more tea. And that's what's going on here. It's a bowl. Seven angels with seven bowls. It's full. It's seven. It's the fullness. And what's it full with? Plagues. Terrible plagues. Just like the wrath of God. What if I told you the cup that you drank from today? The cup of the Lord. It is the cup of that. Did you accept that? No? You taught me that. Jeremiah 25, the Lord says, I have a cup in my hand, a golden cup, and it's full of my wrath, and all the nations shall drink it. And when they say, we won't drink it, you will ensure they will drink it. Jeremiah 57, he says, Babylon is a golden cup. Full of the wine of the wrath of God. These seven angels here have golden bowls or cups full of the plagues, the wrath of God. What are we dealing with here? Elsewhere in the scriptures we find positive cups. Let's have a look quickly at a few positive cups. Jehovah, you are my cup. You uphold my lot. Psalm 60. You will prepare a table before me. My cup shall overflow. Psalm 60. What shall I render to Jehovah? I will take the cup of salvation. Psalm 116. The cup of consolation to drink, Jeremiah 16. What's actually happening here? And I never saw this until I made the connection between cups and bowls. It's the same thing. In fact, these seven angels are God's seven cup bearers. What does a cup bearer mean? What is a cup bearer? What's a cup bearer? 
or king. Well, it brings the wine to the wine. It brings the wine. But he might even taste the wine before he gives it to him. Why? Poison! Who wants a cup of poison? No. No, he doesn't want a cup of poison, Trevor. But here we're being told the seven last bowls of seven flames. What's going on here? Holy Supper. When you take Holy Supper with the right heart, looking into the Lord, trusting to the Lord, saying, Lord, I want your Supper. I want your life. You're drinking the cup of the Lord. Well, what happens when you take it like word? Come on. What does it mean to take it unworthily? There were 12 disciples on the night of the Lord's betrayal. One took it unworthily, didn't they? It was a cup of flame. It was a cup of flame. The same cup that blesses and also plagues us. Why? Well, Paul said this way. Here's the clue. Paul said this way. To those who are saved, who are being saved, we are the aroma of life. The apostles. To those who are perishing, we are the stench. What's he saying? What's Paul saying? What's in these cups? Nothing but light and love. Nothing but light and love. But sometimes when that light and love comes upon us and we see what we are, there's your faith. Okay, then I'm going to say it again. The more internal a process the Lord is doing in your life, the more apocalyptic the archetypes need to be. Okay? So the very cup that we might want to run away from is actually the cup of salvation. I'll give you an example. Okay? We all know the story of King David, right? Committing an altar. Okay, she should have been out of the war. This sort of brings me to my second point. Why the archetype is so important. Should have been out at war, got lazy, you all do it. And while he was lazy, he was up on the rooftop and he happened to look down at the sky, a beautiful woman bathing. Now it's adultery, it's not great. Right. Takes two from sending out of But anyway, she's out there bathing at the right time, he's seen by David. Make a look what you will. He invites her back. Bad news. They have a repair. She goes home. Some time passed and she sends word to King David. I'm pregnant. Oh, oh dear, what are we going to do? Well, how about we just run from our cup? How about we just run from our moment? Cover over. I know what I'll do. I'll, he said, I'll oh, do. He'll call in Uriah, her husband, from the battlefield. Uriah, come talk to me. Oh, that's great. How's the battle going? Good. Come spend some time with your wife. Cover it up. Isn't it? One sin leads to another until you have seven. Didn't work. He was an honourable man. He lay at the king's door and said, I will not go after my wife while my fellow men are on the battlefield. So he said, That is what we're going to do. It's worse. Comes up with a plan. Gives a writer a letter. Assassination. Gets him to deliver it to Joash, the king. Of the army, uh, sorry, the commander of the army. Deliver this to Josh. And says there, Joash, get Uriah out in the middle of the battle. Alright? And when the heat's on, pull back your enemy and let him die. Wow, so Uriah delivers his own assassination. It's getting worse by the moment. Anyway, the sin is hidden. They get away with it. And she moves into the palace. The child dies. But she also gives birth to Solomon. So there's some spiritual message here, different message. And King David's going along and thinking, yeah, that's what meant to be, I suppose. Not. God wants to get through to David and grab it on his own. So along comes Nathan. What did Nathan do? Tells him his story. An archetype. The Lord sent Nathan unto David and said, Come unto him and say to him, Hmm, there are two men in the city, one was rich. The other was poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little lamb, which he had brought up and he nourished it. They grew up together with his children. They did eat his own drink meat and drink from his own cup. 
lying in his bosom, and was to him like a daughter. He came a traveller to the rich man's house. He spared to take one of his own flock. So he dressed for the wayfaring man that was to come unto him, and took the poor man's lamb. And he dressed that for the man who was to come in. Now David's anger was greatly keen at this man, wouldn't you? He's got a whole field full of lambs. He goes to his neighbour, he's got one of the lamb and he steals it, chops it up and offers it to his battle. David's brewing, angry, says, Oh, as the Lord lives, that man who did this thing will surely die. He will restore that lamb fourfold because he did this thing. Because that man had no fear. Nathan said, David, you are that. Isn't that powerful? And again, we come back to the book of Apocalypse, full of all this apocalyptic language. The Lord has set it out there for us to help us examine what's going on inside. It's a way for us to enter in. Because the truth is, when you're right at that cusp, Climb over and get to New Jerusalem. That's where resistance is from. You don't really want to look inside and cut all seven of them. But, like I said, this message, this small chapter, holds up hope. It's hope. And it all has to do with attitude. 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 When you come to the Lord's cup, if your attitude is right, isn't it? It's the cup of salvation. But if your attitude is not right, well, I committed adultery because she didn't love me properly, or whatever it is, you know, whatever we're not bringing to the Lord, whatever thing we hide in our lives, we've all got things that we hide. And they said it to me, she said, we've all got our own brand of dumb. You've got to be a pretty young It's gross. We've all got our own brand of dumb. Isn't it? <laughs> well, whatever we're hiding from the Lord, we come to the cup and we just are nonchalant about it, then we're drinking the cup of Babylon. In other words, the same cup of blessing can be your play. It depends on your attitude. Now, this man here, he's in pain. Spiritual work is his pain. But it's a cup of blessing and your attitude is right. But if your attitude is wrong, you're in for a world of pain. A world of love. Hey, how about that? Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, in the beginning, God, yes, that's it, right? Good God. Created. Come on, the heavens and the earth. Yes, the heavens and the earth. Okay, you know verse 2. And there was darkness, and there was darkness. Ah, he's getting it, he's getting it, yes, okay. Okay, the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. The Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. Okay, so here we are, we're about ready. We're brooded. We're brooded. Okay, so here we are, ready to come over the cusp to New Jerusalem. We have one more enemy in this book we've got to defeat Babylon herself. What's coming up in those seven cups, seven bowls? And if we have the right attitude, there's going to be some pain. This is a good thing. Is it? This is a good thing. It's not bad. When you're experiencing chaos in your life, what should you do? Put it to chaos? Okay. What did you say, Bob? No, don't bother with it. Don't bother with the chaos. Do the first thing that you see. That you know where you go. It's like walking out on a dark night towards the light. Yes. We're going to take it step by step because you know where you're going. Head towards the light, that's it. Yeah. So when you've got chaos in your life, look up. And what are you going to see? Yeah. Every time you see God's home. It's not going to let this fall apart on you. The problem is so often we are trying to do it in our own strength. We're running from that time. Yeah. We don't want the Lord to look in there. Please don't look in there. And he already knows what's in there. Say, cup. Look up and have that right attitude and humility. Lord, let's do this. I'm ready. 
a new energy is going to come inside, a new life is going to come inside. But it's about us keeping our eyes on the Lord, letting go of trying to do this in our own strength. That God gives to us. My final point today is one that goes somewhere else, doesn't it? Today is the temple of God is open. The temple of God is open. And we read that verse 8 and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God of his power. And no one was able to enter the temple to the seventh plague of the seventh plague. So God opens the temple and says, fills it with his smoke and says, this is not going to close ever again. In fact, it's, this is not going to be over until you've done the work of God to send the cross. Paul said, what? Have you not that your body is the temple of God? Say after me, Lord, no, Lord, 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 my body, my, my body, body is your temple. Is your temple. And your temple your, your temple, temple is open. Is open. open. Yeah. So this chapter is reminding us the temple of God is open. And he's doing his work and no one's going to stop it until he's finished. And the thing that I really want you to take away from today is our need to touch heaven. Right? Today, we want to touch heaven. Daily, if we can, touch heaven. If we can have these heavenly moments and remind ourselves the temple of God is open. In my chaos, God is hovering. In my pain, there is strength and blessing. God is in control. And if I keep touching heaven daily like that, then that last little hill that we have to go over is not going to be anywhere as bad as we can. Seven plagues? Actually, it's only for light and love. Well, let's go back to what Ian said. There is not have to put a little bit of clarity here because it's not us picking out. There's the trumpets and the bowls. Yes, trumpets and the bowls. The cups. And for cups. Cup. Well, for the cup is to be, you've got to do something with the contents of the cup you're going to drink. You've got to experience it. Yes. So, the trumpet might be, uh, the trumpet is the announcement that you're going to fly from Los Angeles to uh, Sydney. Right. The bowl yes. is that long, long trip. And all the discomfort and that sort of stuff that you're going to have to experience to get there. I saw, I, mean, I, I saw something on the ABC um, headline thing this, this morning that the person, they, um, they thought that cancer was this terrible, terrible thing, but their life, I, I didn't actually read what they had to say, but Having experienced all the sort of the kindness and loving and caring and all this sort of stuff, it was the life changing experience to the good. Yes. So the bowl doesn't matter, you know, whether it's a bowl of suffering or a flame of suffering. It can or a blessing. It can yeah. also yeah. be a, yeah. it can be. Yeah. So is the bowl is the bowl our need to experience that content. Bill's absolutely right. There's seven trumpets, and every one of those trumpets does something different. But like you said, you can't unhear a trumpet. Right. Now, when we go through the seven bowls, not next month, we'll do Christmas, but in the new year we'll go through the bowls. Each cup relates to the trumpet, just like you said. You know, you can, you can hear a trumpet, but you don't have to drink. And this is the problem. When we drink with the Lord, with that humility, it's nothing but blessing in there. It's nothing but blessing in God. Only good comes from God. But it's the light and the light of heaven. It can't help but show what's in there. And that's where the plague begins. And then I'm suddenly being made to see that I was on the line. Or I was this, or I was that, whatever it is that I've done. And that's the plague. But when you want to grow and transform and be changed, it's a blessing. The light and the love of the peace and love of justice. But if you're not wanting God, then it's nothing but black. And this is why the language is like that. It's, it's written specifically like that. As I said, the more internal work, 
a more uplifting. The archetypes need to be in the Keep remembering that. Keep remembering that. The book won't confuse you. It will start to make sense. And also, it will bless you. The book will bless you. Just like the man doing the push ups. He was not looking at that pain as a bad thing. And what I found in my life, every time pain and tribulation and trials come, if you've got the right attitude, not only do you push through so much better than you do, but it actually turns into a blessing unpresent. And I look back and go, I wouldn't have created that. That's the truth of it. But this is a challenge for us, and I'm, I'm trying to set us up for next year when we actually go through the fold, because it's, it's apocalyptic horror, really, what we're going to look at. But then looking at our shadow self is. You know, this is why we run from our shadow self. This is why it's so much easier to point the finger and to judge every process. And yet, they are nothing more than apocalyptic archetypes of the view. They do not. What you see in them is really just reflecting back states that are inside the view. But we'll leave it there. And it's a, good, it's a good point you bring up there. We're shifting from trumpets, which deals with our rational, our understanding, and now we're going to the very core, our will. Let's just say it out to Lord, Lord, you are, you are, you are my cup, my, my cup, cup of salvation. Of salvation. Because of you, Lord. Because, because of you, Lord. My life, my life overflows. Overflows. Yeah. Blessing. Blessing. I learn. We'll close now, but just think about these words one last time. I'm going to give you a, your assignment. He that takes not his cross and follows after me is not worthy. Then cup. He that doesn't drink the cup is not worthy. He that finds his life will lose it. He that loses his life drinking the cup will find it. Up is down. Here's your assignment for the month. Okay? I'm trying to fix it in your own stubborn strength. I'm not saying the southern people, you are beautiful people, you are people doing the work. You have an amazing group of people. You are people doing the work. But there are areas in your life where you're being southern. You all are. Stop being southern. Be like me and my own eternity. Say, Lord, give me fun. Pray. Right, ask the Lord for strength. Do. Next time you find yourself in a cup moment, stop and say, let go of that dog. Tell yourself, let go of that dog. Trust it. Say Psalm 4211. I'll send this out by our email. Psalm 4211 says, It says, Why art thou downcast, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the help of my countenance in my life. Psalm 4211. So there's your response. If you could assist me in one last thing, just thinking a new commandment as we close the word, and then we'll have some lunch. And hopefully you are all in the cup of blessing. Amen? Amen. A new I give unto you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you love one another, as I have loved you. By this shall I know you are my disciples, if you have loved one another. Disciples, if you have not one to another, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, the Lord lift up his hands and give you everlasting peace. Amen. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.